You are listening to Supplement Source, the official podcast of the Council for Responsible Nutrition. And now, your host, Jeff Ventura. Hello, and thanks for listening to the Supplement Source podcast. My name is Jeff Ventura, the Vice President of Communications here at CRN. And we are excited to be welcoming a lot of our speakers from the annual event held in Salt Lake City this year. For those of you who could not attend, uh, fear not, because we are going to bring many of these folks on to Supplement Source uh, to talk about what they talked about at the conference. One of the speakers at our marketing event, Wellcoms, uh, is Brian Yam, the Vice President of Quality and Regulatory Affairs for Blue Ocean Regulatory. Like he did for attendees at the Wellcoms event, he's going to be talking to us today about Amazon and what supplement companies uh, need to know and can do when attempting to navigate what uh, is surely a complicated and complex uh, landscape. Welcome, Brian. So glad to have you on the Supplement Source podcast. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here and, and good to talk to you again. It's been it's been a couple weeks. It's been a couple <laughs> weeks. So I know. I know. Yeah. We listen. I I have heard nothing but positive feedback about your presentation uh, at Wellcoms. And then I also caught, of course, the the write up in the trade press uh, about it. So you've uh, obviously made an impression. And the goal here to have you on today is really we're trying to memorialize some of that uh, fantastic content that we had at the conference. And one way to make that you know more broadly accessible uh, is obviously to um, get some folks to come on the podcast today. And you're the first person uh, of the Wellcoms group uh, to, uh, to come on. So thank you very, very much. Um, we're excited to talk to you today about Amazon. Oh, likewise. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let, let's do this. I'm excited. Well, so I think one of the things that, um, you know, people, I mean, I, I saw it in the room. I mean, I saw it on people's faces. They are tuned in, uh, to how the heck to figure out or to sort of decode or unpack. I mean, choose your word. Uh, you know, Amazon and just sort of dealing with uh, the complexities of Amazon because it's, you know, it's sort of like it's necessary and yet the same, you know, the same token, it poses so many uh, challenges for uh, su- supplement brands. Um, what what do you think the sort of the, the biggest message is that you, that you give brands uh, in terms of that kind of complexity? Yeah, well, I think... Good I luck. Think first thing, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, a lot of brands know it's the Wild West. And right. I think there are a lot of good brands out there that want to do things the right way. And on the surface, you know, the chat GPTs of the world, Google, the content out there isn't great. And it doesn't really give a full a picture of what compliance really entails and then you throw Amazon in there and how they change things all the time and they have their algorithms but just you know if we remove Amazon for just a quick second here just FDA FTC the rules are broad they can get quite detailed you throw in litigation enforcement and all that stuff in there it gets quite complicated and you know it can be quite overwhelming to the startup brand, if you will, even to the larger CPU brands. That's why they have a, a t- an entire team of quality people, food safety, doctors and lawyers, all of that. There's a reason for that. And so it's, it's, you know, to start with, it's important to understand just to lay the land. What are we trying to get ourselves into? You know, do we want to play in Amazon? Do we want to play DSC? Do we want to play in brick and mortar? Mm-hmm. And so that's typically where we start. Where do you guys want to play? And then from there, kind of work backwards. What are those requirements specifically for those platforms, for, for those digital platforms, those distributors? And then another step back for the brand. What does the brand or the entrepreneur care about for the cu- customer, mm-hmm. the quality of the product, the compliance, their reputation? And then, and then of course, the foundational component is what are FDA's expectations? What are FTC's expectations? What are bare minimums and testing? So it's kind of like this multi-layered approach. And then it kind of just 
breaks it down into chunks that are a little bit more feasible. Like we, we, we scale things down a little bit. You're not trying to conquer the entire space. We're just conquering one channel first and then kind of scaling the operation for that particular brand, given their size, given their budget, given their time frame. So that's kind of how we like to, to tackle it. But in the scope of Amazon, you know, there are so many things coming out. They, they, they do change their rules over time. The, the latest Sometimes overnight. Are, yeah, well, it seems that way, doesn't it? <laughs> And uh, I, I remember even the, the, the latest one, the one when they announced in April, I remember the night before, two nights before my LinkedIn feed, there were these like cryptic messages on Twitter and then LinkedIn, like, hey, Amazon's going to change this. Um, they're going to add this test. They're going to add this. It was all piecemeal. And I think every, everyone was wondering what's really going on here. And then, of course, Amazon released the official protocols and they did the webinar, et cetera, et cetera. And, and here we are today. Yeah, it, and it seems like uh, those who are um, who ha- are uninitiated to um, you know having to deal with Amazon, uh, you know, m- may you know there may be more of an importance in 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 terms of learning and understanding the platform in the sense that we were just we were just observing this week all that's going on uh, in the you know sort of uh, chain retail space. And, you know, the closures of CVS and the closures uh, at Walgreens and, you know, the sort of the CEO at CVS, you know, was changed up. And there's just been a lot of kind of downward pressure in that industry. And, you know, it's not, you know, the the retail uh, sort of uh, chain uh, for sales uh, is obviously going to be, you know, impacted, you know, if they continue to, you know, have trouble. Uh, forcing a lot of uh, brands to really uh, to their online sales to become, you know, sort of even more important if they're so, you know, learning as much as they can about the the vagaries of, of Amazon's platform is probably in their best interest at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, like you said, there's this not crackdown, but I think there's this reality that brick and mortar might not be where the the fruit is, uh, at least not what it used to be. And yeah, you're seeing a lot of brands. Obviously, the barrier to entry is is less when we just go on sell online. Mm-hmm. And I think other brands are looking for other sources of sales, and that does look like Amazon. That mm-hmm. could look like Amazon pretty easily. It looks like these other online distributor models. One of the um, one of the things not to interrupt you. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, it was kind of uh, I, I heard in in that Wellcoms event from folks is the difficulty that folks have in even communicating uh, with Amazon. Do, do you find that um, some of um, your clients uh, have expressed that that it's it's sort of difficult to sort of get answers from the source? Yeah, that's that's something that we've um, noticed right off the bat. Even previous to these uh, to these latest requirements, there's been this significant inconsistency applied across the board. Mm-hmm. So there's there have been some brands that I've worked directly with. We're very compliant in our language, fairly conservative, um, and I remember it was like a multi-vitamin type product, and they got flagged immediately upon listing. As having non-compliant language, uh, I can I can I can't go to the specifics, of course, of that no, particular sure. brand, but I can <laughs> I can for sure say that there was nothing remotely close to that. It was a very general support claim, if you will. And uh, when we want to get further insight, they would give us Amazon, at least in this particular contact. Well, first of all, getting a contact was difficult, right. but once we got the contact, the information was just regurgitated terms and conditions mm. or uh, something along the lines of, well, if you get your product approved by FDA or by a lawyer, then that's okay, which you and I both know that doesn't happen. No, no supplements are approved by the <laughs> FDA. A lawyer's not going to approve these supplements. But you get this you get this feedback, this pushback. Now, what I think is frustrating for a lot of brands is that they didn't have a consultant, in, in our case, there to kind of guide the conversation. Oh, yeah. They would have trusted Amazon's feedback, and now they're really lost. So... We've seen that, and then we've seen the opposite. Um, and even in that example, their competitors 
uh, they were okay, and they were making more, more uh, stronger claims. And for whatever reason, the listing process didn't flag them, and uh, that was one of the, the the talking points we had. Like, how how did that brand get on there, et cetera? And they had to go back, and eventually, it was sorted. But it took months mm. uh, for essentially just a, you know, in my opinion, a clerical or administrative or algorithmic error. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, you're you're you are seeing that. Um, with regards to these new requirements, the, the latest one and the additional testing, you know, we are seeing inconsistent requirements in terms of the, the testing being flagged. Mm. So some products that are in that fitness space are being flagged immediately. Others, not so much, or maybe there's a time component to it. So it, it could be, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but I wouldn't be surprised if that inconsistency continues a little bit longer. Hopefully that will be addressed mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in short order. Yeah, yeah. So what what else are we what else do you want to talk about when it comes to, to Amazon? You had so much good advice uh, for folks there. Your your deck was so informative. But in this in this format when you know you're obviously not in a room with your deck um, uh, you're talking to you know, the podcast audience here. Um, but, but what, what do they need to know, um, beyond what we've already talked about? Give me some, give me some other pointers. Sure. Yeah. 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 So I think one thing that keep, comes to mind mm. and I see this a lot for even the large or medium sized brands, uh, medium to small size brands, if you will. And that is, it's important to set the expectations with the manufacturers now because mm. Maybe a month ago, sorry, six months ago, a year ago, the test protocol mm-hmm. for that particular product was set to different limits than, let's say, Amazon's requirements as of, of today. Okay. So I've seen this with manufacturers. So their default process would be to test their supplements to U, uh, USP limits, mm-hmm. or they'll test it to APA limits, HPA limits. Mm-hmm. That's built into their protocols, and then they have tested you know, the brand's product over time, and it's been relatively fine. But we now know that Amazon's specific testing requirements really piggyback off the NSF requirements. Mm-hmm. And now it's this conversation of, hey, manufacturer, can you please change the specifications so we're now meeting NSF limits? Mm-hmm. And we are seeing some pushback on that. Some manufacturers may not like that. They like the status quo. Everything's been good. They've had no failures, and they might be a little bit concerned that Oh, now that we're imposing NSF limits, it might change the cost. It might change lead times for for the manufacturer. It might change um, failure occurrence as well. So I think that's one big takeaway is let's start having that conversation with the manufacturers now and imposing these new limits. Uh, Whether you go to Amazon or not, most likely you want to move to Amazon. That's number one. And I think it's just good to have your product and testing in a place where you've got that ability to move into Amazon in the future or somewhere else. Most likely NSF limits might be the standard, at least for the shorter term, for the next couple of years. Um, now that Amazon's kind of embraced that that uh, those requirements from NSF. So that's number one. And then number two, that's a, so that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a that's a boy, you know, it it strikes you when you hear that kind of explanation, the what a dramatic impact even the slightest change uh you know that they institute can have on an industry yeah absolutely um and we've seen this with even with some brands that have gone through the amazon process as of late uh the testing may have revealed that the product didn't comply Mm -hmm. and they may have realized that there's a lab method issue uh, given the latest requirements, so that the lab method that it, NSF requires, or the the, the sensitivity, or the uh, or the the lower threshold is different from what was normally done, mm. that might reveal a supply chain issue. Mm-hmm. Okay, these aren't the right ingredients, or maybe the lab method needs to be adjusted or revamped. And so there's been some big revelations for the brand, and then out of that, there could be. A realization that the current manufacturer might not be the right partner for them, I, um, you know, you know, butting heads, you know, emotions, right? All of those mm-hmm. things come up, um, and so it gets a little bit gritty behind the scenes, um, and, and so we want to we want to anticipate those. 
you were going to bring up a second point, and I and I think I stepped on that, and I apologize. Um, what was the other thing you were going to say? Do you recall? Yeah, yeah. So it was around um, not so step one is really around setting those testing limits mm-hmm. and, and maybe moving into the NSF. But step two is let's test sooner than later. Sure. Um, a, a lot of a lot of brands might not have been testing all their ingredient quantities. Maybe they've been doing one or two of the ingredients, maybe none of the ingredients. And I think it's important for us to see where your product stacks up now with ingredient quantity testing, um, with heavy metals. That's a big one. But maybe the microbials, certain microbials weren't necessarily tested before. Now they are required for NSF so or for Amazon. And I think it's really important for us to do that testing now, while all the inventory that the manufacturer versus, you know, at an Amazon warehouse, per se, or at the brand's warehouse. So I, I think that's really important just to see where you line up and troubleshoot, right? That That's going to reveal if there's any issues. Let's, let's fix it. Let's fix it now rather than when you have a retailer commitment and then the product lands there, whereas now you can't sell it because of the oh testing issue that arise, you know, at that time. So we don't want that headache. Sure. I'd rather solve everything now. But those are the two big ones. I think, you know, there is a, there is a cost investment for testing, mm-hmm. right? There could be the potential for a failure or some sort of non-conformance or out-of-spec situation. Um, and then now you have to manage this relationship a little bit differently now that we're changing the goalpost, if you will, with regards to the testing. So I think those two already would be pretty big, um, big levers that we can pull right now in the short term to kind of get the brand ready for, for an Amazon future or, you know, that type of play. Do most brands, most of your clients, um, do they, do they come to you smart and proactive and know that they need you or do they come to you in an absolute meltdown (laughs) because, because (laughs) they've, they've tried to navigate this on their own and they, they now have product, you know, that they can't sell sitting in a warehouse somewhere and they realize that they, they really don't know. They don't know the terrain as well as they thought they, or they just had expectations that it would be more of a plug and play kind of uh, interaction with Amazon, and it's not. Oh my gosh! It's, it's all three buckets. Yeah, so we've got we've got the where we've in a situation. I need to, there's a fire. Yeah. To, we want yeah. to do this right. How do we do that? Suddenly your and fee. Then, suddenly like, your fee is very reasonable. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's, that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. And, you know, there's a part of me that wishes the fires weren't there. Yeah. Um, and there, I think you mentioned that, too. There's this plug-and-play assumption. Mm-hmm. And I wish that was true. Um, I always tell my clients, like, my rule should not exist. If everyone kind of did the things the right way, right. I shouldn't exist. But the reality is... Um, you know, these things do happen. Now, our clients, we have the two big buckets. We've got, I would say, um, the majority of our clients come from the 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 bucket of, we want to do this right, how do we do this? Mm-hmm. And then others are feeling, oh, there are some different pressures now. Let's get this fixed. And then there's a small bucket of the fires. Mm-hmm. Um, usually the problem with the, the bucket of fires, I don't mind working with them. Like you said, they all of a sudden they've got the money for everything and, and to pay on time all good. But the bigger issue with the fires is that in order for us to properly fix it, we're making really, really significant changes because in the years prior to that, we've been running the operations in a very different way, mm-hmm. probably in a non-compliant way. So you've got to make some really big, significant moves that could impact the business significantly. Mm-hmm. And they may not have expected that. They're thinking, oh, what if we just retest it? What if we uh, label it different, like simple fixes. Right. Sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes yeah. you're buying brand new raw materials and you got to dump old inventory out. Uh, it can get pretty messy. Yeah, yeah. And I think I feel for them because, you know, I, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but sometimes we, we have to. Well, just that's the, kind of the well, world that I live in. And it's not so much, you know, who can blame them? I mean, it's not so much naivete. I mean, I think that. You know, some of it is, you know, Amazon on the cons- from the consumer perspective, you know, where we're all consumers of Amazon, you know, as a service, um, they have made it seem so seamless, you know, to the, the consumer who's ordering things like it couldn't be, 
you know, especially if you live in an urban area, it couldn't be easier. I mean, you, you know, you order a pair of socks and you get them, you know, sometimes the same day. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I mean, it's, That's it's right. insane. So, you know, yeah. and I think that, you know, part, you know, people sometimes I, I would assume think that that same level of, um, ease and, you know, sort of, uh, just, you know, the, the, the ease with which you can deal with them, uh, would apply when you, when you become, you go from a buyer to a seller. But the reality, as you've said, is, you know, it's not necessarily the case. Yeah. That's, um, it's, it's, Especially so with a regulated I, I, with a regulated product in particular. Yeah, you know, and and you're not the first to bring that up. There are a lot of people that are coming from this from outside of the supplement industry that thinking about starting their own supplement brand. They've been very successful in in their other previous lives, and they ask the same question. They're wondering what's going on. Why do we have to do this? Trust but verify. Why can't we just assume it's turnkey? You know, I put my money in. Why can't I get my product out? Why why do we have to do this? And I think there's an element of Yes, it's the Wild West. We've heard all the same, you know, the same talking points before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, just knowing what we know in the industry, yeah, we do want to trust but verify. But I think if we look at, there's like recently there was a a a recall or there was a death with uh, McDonald's. I don't know if you saw that in the news the other day. Yeah, it's the onions. um, Yeah, the onions. Yeah. And so my not the beef because they're they've they've apparently yeah they've apparently have one of the safest you know beef you know meat supplies uh yes. in the world you know because that's their you yep. know one mistake there and they're 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 gonna really uh have their business damaged but yeah the onions correct it's the onions. it's it's not like yeah they're they're you know you cook the beef but you can't cook the onions right right um and so the the call out there is that Think of McDonald's. Think of how big they are. They're lawyered up. They've got mm-hmm. quality, food safety. They've been in the business for years and years and years. And for some reason, if they have the issue once in a while, right, hopefully never again, um, how can, you know, if McDonald gets caught, how can a small co-packer or even a large co-packer, how can we assume that they're not going to get caught either? Yeah. And, and then to that, Sometimes there are things, uh, you know, stuff hit a fan that's completely outside your control. You can only do so much. Mm-hmm. You got to be ready to navigate. And you, you know, that scope of compliance, the recall actions, the investigations, the the PR component, how you message that, and how you resolve it is so important. If you don't have that compliance foundation, it's really hard to navigate swiftly. Because then you're you're kind of building your compliance at the same time you're trying to fix something that's really difficult to do and execute when you're in a crisis scenario. Um, sort of like build, building the plane plan. while you fly it. That's exactly. It. Yeah. And, and whereas if there are some of these other brands that come in, like let's figure out how to do it right, and they build out all the programs, they build out the procedures, they have the right understanding um, and values built all behind it, and 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 they've got a good supply chain, they got a good manufacturer, they got the right ingredients. Now you're really mitigating that risk. And if something were to happen completely outside of your control, and it's quite possible, um, you know what to do, how to navigate that. And, um, and you know, as a consumer, we all know recalls and food safety issues happen. It's more about how do, how do we uh, constrain it? How do we fix it? And how do you communicate that at a regular interval to your customers? I think that's so important. And, uh, and that's where the compliance component all fits into it so that you can do all of those key things for the customer um, much more swiftly and, and build that trust and reputation, even though you might have a recall. Uh, I think that's so important to just factor into this whole conversation and think it's not just this plug and play. There's these other things we can't foresee that we have to be ready for. Well, and I think, uh, Brian, you're going to get uh, more folks calling you uh, looking for that state of readiness. Um, we're out of time today, but I, I really want to thank you again for coming on the show and for uh, imparting your wisdom to the folks who couldn't make it out to see you in Salt Lake City at Convergence. Um, thank you so much, uh, Brian Yam from Blue Ocean Regulatory. You are welcome back anytime, sir. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Okay. Have a great day.